is Christina Napster. I'm a library professional at Moore Middle School in Redlands, where I work with the incomparable Joan Hall, teacher librarian extraordinaire. Joan's at four middle schools, and I'm one of them, so I get a quarter of Joan, which I'm so lucky because she's just an awesome mentor. Um, in fact, I like her so much, I decided to dedicate my presentation. I don't know if you can dedicate these, but I decided I wanted to dedicate mine to Joan. And if you can't read in the shape of a heart, it says dedicated to and inspired by my boss friend and mentor, Joan McCall, who nurtures, cheerleads, and improves everything I do and embodies a love for libraries. She's awesome and she really does inspire me and we're a great team. Most of these things we have like just put our heads together and, and we get dangerous sometimes. So there's my dedication. So I am actually quite honored to be here presenting to you. This is my first presentation ever, and, and I'm really excited to be getting to do it with you. I always told Joan I just love library people because not only are we like-minded, but everyone's always so encouraging and open-minded, so I really appreciate being here. So at this point, you're probably wondering, why am I here, and what are these mysterious library levities? students in learning in the library. So we're kind of going to go through the whole school here with different ideas and things that kids can do in the library to not only learn but to have fun. So the fun part is what I call the tricks. And of course these tricks have goals. And our goals are number one exposure. So I like to expose the kids to ideas, people, words, information that they may not have ever heard of otherwise. The second goal is learning, which is totally gross, so don't ever tell the kids that it's involves learning at all. And the third is fuzzy feelings about the library. So I'm going for a little subliminal positive PR for our libraries here with these programs. Of course we have to have rules, and the rules are they have to be cheap and they have to be easy. I think both of those rules are for obvious reasons, but if the reasons aren't obvious to you, see me after class and I'll explain that in more detail. So now, I'm going to take you on a journey back in time to the late 1970s to discover the historical origins of trickery. Everything I know about tricking kids, I learned from my dad. My dad is a really, really energetic man. And by energetic, I mean he might have a possible hyperactivity disorder. So every Saturday morning, my dad would wake up at the crack of dawn and go play tennis. And here I am in the late 1970s, I'm on the left, with my two sisters. And my dad would go play tennis at the crack of dawn. And after dawn had been cracked for about an hour or two, my sisters and I would wake up and come downstairs and go watch cartoons and we'd watch the Smurfs or something like that. So my dad would finally get home a couple hours later and he would come in and see us lounging on the couch and he would say, anybody want to play Little House on the Prairie? And look at these kids. Do you think we wanted to play Little House on the Prairie? Of course, that was like our favorite show. We were all running upstairs, racing to get dressed, raced down to the backyard, and we found out Little House on the Prairie was <laughs> which wouldn't have been so bad, but my dad took all the good jobs. So episode one of Little House on the Prairie included half pint holding a garbage bag while Pa dumped in the grass cookies. Of course, I was half pint and I had to hold the bag for my dad. So in subsequent months and years, my dad invited us to play things like Dukes of Hazard, which involved me handing him the wrong tool while he was switched under our ball belt, and Karate Kid, which was basically just wax on and wax off. So my dad was a master of trickery, and that's where I kind of got the idea. I should have said no to all these invitations, but I didn't, because he tricked me every time. And so anyway, let's see. This brings me to a philosophical question, which is, are libraries a good place for tricking children? To which I answer, yes. Not on information. 
information, of course, but on how much fun they're having getting that information. So to give you a little visual, I made this library fun meter. So in, I, I have fun here measured in cubic ounces of fun. And in the green, you'll see how much fun these activities should empirically warrant. And in the purple, you see how much fun the kids think they're having. So amazing, <laughs> incredible, these library levities just have this great effect. So what, what I was going to say before I change the slide was that I think even though in the 1970s, yes, we were gullible, I think some things about kids haven't changed, even teenagers. And it is that they still just want to have fun, even the boys. So, with no further ado, we will talk about library levities. So, what I want to start with when I talk about the levities is, is yes, there are seasonal programs in the library. And I, the way I, I handle it is, we have the circulation desk where we have a corner of that desk where we kind of dedicate it to having fun, interesting things. So the kids come into the library and they kind of know where to look for something fun or interesting. And that's where I put just trivia and the different things that we're going to talk about today. Um, I always encourage the kids to work together because I think it's just funner if you have a larger group there. And, and we try to do a lot of things orally. I don't do a lot of written trivia or anything like that. Um, we also always encourage our students to use the resources that are in the library, like books, computers, anything like that, to look up information. There's a couple activities that require them to look up words, and, and yes, I would, I would definitely want them to use what we have in the library to do that. But there are others that I'm okay with them just guessing on some of the answers to things like trivia. Basically because, as I mentioned, one of the goals was exposure. So I would rather them guess and then learn a couple facts or two by going through and me telling them the right answers than feel discouraged and walk away. So again, I, I just want to expose them to things. So we're going to start off in September here, where we're, we're having our students exercise the right to remain educated on Constitution Day. And Constitution Day, over the last couple of years, we've kind of expanded into Constitution Week. So one of the games I developed just for you, it's just kind of a weird, funny game, which I wish you could see better. It's called Which Founding Father Could Be Your BFF? So take this exciting quiz and find out. Question one, how many wooden teeth do you have? A, a full set, toothbrushes are so tomorrow. B, three, or C, that's not wood, that's the little ivory, I'm so sure. <laughs> so you can answer that in your head. Number two, how often do you powder your wig? Once a day, right before bed. B, every time you go to the restroom. C, twice a week. Number three, which US currency bears your likeness? Two dollar bill, hundred dollar bill, or one dollar bill? Four, do you have a favorite quilt color? No, yes, maybe. Congratulations, if you answered any of these questions, you could be BFFs with an old and tiny dude. And I just made that for you guys for fun. I don't think I'd actually give this to kids because it'd probably confuse them, but just to give you an idea of kind of keeping it lighthearted maybe at the start, and then later you can get into more serious trivia like this. So we have trivia sometimes in the library right at the circulation desk, and students can answer the questions out loud. If I'm not available, which because Joan and I aren't always there together, a lot of times I'm having to be busy elsewhere in the library, I do have library assistants that I can give them an answer sheet, and, and students can tell them the answers, and they can tell them if they're right or not. So if you'd like to try some Constitution trivia, what are the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution called? A, Declaration of Independence, B, the Bill of Rights, or C, the first 10? Anybody know? The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, of course. And so anyway, I'm sure you all can, can figure out most of this trivia here. So I just would put out something like that kind of trivia. I've also done this before. Do you know your constitutionally protected rights? Prove it. Play Bill of Rights or Bill of Wrongs. So in, in this, I set up certain different scenarios where students have to name the amendment that guarantees the constitutional right, identify the imposters, and exercise their right to remain educated. So for this particular one, I'll give you an example. Um, I have the right to throw you in jail without a trial if I suspect you have, may have bent the pages in the lightning thief. Do, you, do I have the right to do that or not? What do you think? No, of course not. The 
Sixth Amendment protects your right to a speedy and public trial. Once the jury finds you guilty of page bending, then we can throw you in jail. <laughs> Wrong again. The punishment actually has to fit the crime. So I just try to set up little scenarios where they would have to figure out which of their constitutional rights is being exercised or being denied. So it's just something fun where they're kind of having to think. And, yeah. Have you used a specific one? With the students before? I have used it once before, yeah. And how did they do with it? Um, mostly they just kind of read the things and get kind of confused and they think about it a little bit. But what I think is fun about it is that they don't have to know the answers. I just want to point out some things to them. So really I'm not testing their knowledge and I'm not going to grade them. It's just, again, exposure. You might explain too how you display that. Oh, what so does it look like on the desk? On the desk, I have like little plastic kind of display. I don't know what you frames. Yeah, yeah, where I put in the trivia and just have it kind of standing there. And the students come along, and I have answer sheets behind the desk. So I have student helpers who can kind of guide people through this too. But in the beginning, when things are a little bit slow, I can stand there and, and kind of talk them through it. And most of them, I try to make it a little lighthearted too. So one of them is, I have the right to make you balance a stack of 25 books on your head while singing a Justin Bieber song if you have an overdue book. Mm -hmm. And that one is wrong. That would be cruel and unusual punishment, which is prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. So not, none of it is like super serious stuff. It's just kind of fun and to get them to leave. And moving right along, in October, we have done an activity we call vocabulary. And so vocabulary is a vocabulary challenge. And here are the instructions. Want to win the cutest pumpkin in the world? Mrs. Nasser will pick a new word each day from now until Halloween. If you can tell her or write it down if she's busy, the correct definition, and use the word in a sentence, you earn a chance to win these adorable pumpkins. So which adorable pumpkins you're probably wondering? These adorable pumpkins, and they're, I just get really little ones, they're really cheap and they're really cute. For some reason, kids, anytime I offer a prize, no matter what it is, it's like they want it. Like, I've offered monkey stickers before, and, and everyone's crazy to get a monkey sticker. <laughs> These pumpkins are really popular. So I'll pick a new gross or disgusting or scary word each day for about two weeks before Halloween, and the kids have one opportunity each day to put their name on a little card and enter it in the drawing if they can correctly identify the definition and use the word in a sentence. So in the past I had um, the cutest pumpkin in the world, of course, the first year I did it, and his stunt double and the eagle twin. And then this year I had the spawn of the cutest pumpkin, it and junior, because I always name my pumpkin. And here are two of our three winners this year. They won the pumpkins. And here are some examples of the vocabulary words that I used. And the first one is phantasm, illusion, phantom, ghost. There is a rumor that a phantasm ha haunts the library, flushing toilets to communicate with the living. That's actually true. There is that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I don't write the words up until the day after that word has been the word of the day. But then after that day, I, I want to—I really want the kids to like learn a new word. So I put them up with a kind of funny sentence. So even if a kid isn't playing but says, "Oh, what's that poster?" Then hopefully they'll they'll pick up a new word. With a and this is chart paper. Yeah, this is chart paper hung on a big window to Jones' office. <laughs> That's right by our circulation desk. Oh yeah. So to further the fun of this activity, Joan actually set up a blog on our school website, which is, we use School Fusion, but we have a website where students could at the time log on and they'd get like a secret identity and they could add a sentence to this, to an interactive Halloween story. The only catch was they had to be using one of the words from this vocabulary contest that year. So they could add a sentence and it ended up being really fun and they did a really good job on that. So that's our October vocabulary. In November, we like to do something with 
like to help a featherless turkey with the Thanksgiving thing. The Thanksgiving thing starts with a featherless turkey, and here are the instructions for this one. If a student, I'm going to say you, if you can correctly identify whether this Thanksgiving trivia is fact or fabrication, you will earn a blank turkey feather. Decorate the turkey feather however you wish, then bring the feather back so we can give this naked turkey some feathers before Thanksgiving rolls around. So I just make a big round turkey-shaped body with a little turkey head that has no feathers at all. And when students come to the library, they can answer a different trivia question each day and earn a different feather each day that they can decorate. So here's an example of one of our creatively decorated turkeys. Started out with just that blank round circle, and then the students who correctly identified whether it was a Thanksgiving fact or fabrication got to make their own little turkey feather. And they're very creative, and they like, they really like doing this because Everybody has something to say. Some kids put their name, some people put the name of the school. One kid wrote taquitos because he's really into taquitos and he's done that every year since. I don't know why. He has a love of taquitos. <laughs> so it's just fun to see what they will come up with to put on their feather. And an example of some of the trivia I've used in the past is like number one here. The pilgrims were seeking religious freedom because they felt the Church of England was too strict and serious. This is kind of a trick question. Does anybody have a guess? The correct answer is false. They actually thought the Church of England was too liberal and freewheeling. So this is one that I'm really okay with students guessing, and I'm, I'm very liberal about saying, oh, think about it again if they guess wrong, because then they know it's the opposite one because I really want them to decorate their turkey feather. And really, I just want to bring up some myths that we have about Thanksgiving and kind of straighten them out on that. Um, I also do some kind of more contemporary trivia, like the last one. The world's largest pumpkin pie was made in New Bremen, Ohio. Amazingly, this pie was 20 feet in diameter and weighed 3,699 pounds. That's actually true. And so I you know, try to mix historical information with contemporary stuff so that we can just have a little fun. I skip December altogether because it's way too busy to do anything else in my brain. It's usually pretty short. So when we come back in January, we do um, think you know a lot about Martin Luther King Jr. take the MLK Trivia Challenge and they'll do anything for a fortune cookie Chinese New Year trivia. <laughs> so first, we'll talk about Martin Luther King. The Martin Luther King Trivia Challenge works like this. We, we select a Martin Luther King quote, usually not one of his most famous quotes, but a, probably a pretty famous quote. I blank out most of the key words, which I don't know if you can see down here, that's, that's where it is. And each day, I give students a different set of trivia questions about Martin Luther King Jr. And if they can answer those correctly, that unlocks a word from the quote. So each day, they'll get maybe a word or two to start filling in the quote. And if they can figure out the quote before the end of the week, they're a genius. And, and we love them. We don't give prizes for this, but it's just we really respect them. And so this year's quote was, History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. So even though the quote has some big words in it, I, I like it because it, it really talks a lot about what was going on at, at the time, and it's just a, a really neat thing to talk about with students, I think. And here's some examples of some of the Martin Luther King trivia that I've had in the past for students to unlock the words. One of the questions, Martin Luther King Jr. was best known for his philosophy of black nationalism, civil disobedience, and socialism. Again, students are encouraged to go to the books that we have in the library or the internet to look these answers up. But I'm also happy to discuss with them the answers if they just take a guess. And it's just a great, you know, conversation, I guess, talking about what civil disobedience is with a middle school student, you know, might not work for an elementary school student, but it's, it's just an eye-opener for some of them. Next 
we, we always try to do something for Chinese New Year, and, and it's usually just a really brief trivia game. So here's some Chinese New Year trivia. According to Chinese custom on New Year's Day, you shouldn't eat anything, leave home, or clean the house. It's actually clean the house, because your house should have already been cleaned. So again, it's, it's just, this is totally just for fun, and I recommend if you have something that you want done in your library and you want kids to do it, bring fortune cookies, because they will do anything, anything you want for this crusty little fortune cookie. They love it, and I like this one too, just because I like talking about culture with students, and so a lot of Asian students who, who actually do celebrate Chinese New Year will come up and they'll feel like, oh, I'm a pro at this, I can ace this, and, and it's fun to hear about their customs, you know, and how they differ from what other people may be doing. Just a good time all around. In February, we do something very fun, which is we make Valentines for our favorite books. So here's a student making a valentine. She's a great artist. And the instructions students receive are, we love books. If you love books too, then make your favorite book a valentine. Tell it why you love it. Be descriptive. Don't just say it's good. The book will think you don't really love it. And here are some ideas. So I, I give them, I on a little sign, I have a list of adjectives that I you know, they can choose from where they can think of their own. I think often when we ask a kid what, what book do you like and why, they can't put it into words. So sometimes they, it's helpful to have a list up there that they can choose from and, and use some really descriptive words. So this year, here were some of the Valentines that students made. This is for the book Scrawl, and the student wrote it satisfying, powerful, and hilarious, spelled H-A, but that's okay. We're not correcting the spelling. This was a really cool one for the Maximum Rice Ride series, where she, the girl has wings in it, and I thought that was clever. And then here's a, just a display of all of the Valentines on that window again. And again, I just, I like seeing students do something creative. I'm always surprised at the kids who want to do this. It's not always the ones that you would think. Sometimes it's kind of a rough open kid who, who does this. But I also like it because it's kind of a wall of recommendations for other students to look at and get ideas on maybe a book that they want to read and why they want to read it. If someone says it's hilarious, that might appeal to, to a student. I've had teachers do this in the past, and one of our teachers is kind of a cowboy of a guy. He's a middle-aged gentleman, and his students just sat there for 20 minutes watching him make bubbly letters for his favorite book, and he just takes his time and does something really creative. And, and that's always fun, too, for teachers to be telling kids about what their reading habits are and what their favorite books are. In March, we have done in the past, I've only done this once, but I think I'll, I'll have to revive it. But we have done a Women's History Library scavenger hunt. So many of you have probably already done scavenger hunts in your libraries. Um, I'll get to the title of this one later, but it's, it's just your basic library scavenger hunt. So we, we have some questions here for students. Like, um, well, here's, here are the instructions. You can't read it up there. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to scour the Moore Library for information required by the questions on this scavenger hunt. All information demanded can be found in books on the shelves of this library. We've even provided clues. The book titles and Dewey addresses will lead you to the answers you seek. Good luck. So here I have just the book title, and I have the Dewey number, and even the page number that students should turn to. And my first question is, in what year was the 18th Amendment allowing women the right to vote passed? So students would go to that book, of course, open to the page, find the answer, and write down the answer. And this was a 10 question scavenger hunt, which I gave them the whole month of March to complete. This is the most awesome prize I think we've ever offered in our library. But the prize for this was the opportunity for their face to be on this photoshopped version of the Sergeant Beatles, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. 
which my husband who's a graphic designer, I had to hire him to help me do this. But um, you can see we altered. This is probably illegal too, so I hope there's a statute of limitations on this. I hope nobody reports me for doing this. But all of the faces that were originally on the album cover, we kept some of them, but most of them have been replaced by famous women in history. So we see um, Justice Sotomayor, uh, Maya Angelou, Oprah Winfrey, Taylor Swift, some suffragettes over here. We have Emily Dickinson, some comedians, and of course the most famous women of all, there's Joan McCall, and there's me, right in the middle. <laughs> So students were told that if they completed the whole scavenger hunt of 10 questions, that they could have their face included on this tremendous album cover. And the year we did it, we had quite a few, I think, well, by quite a few, I'm talking like 10 to 15 kids, which to me, it feels like a lot to complete a scavenger hunt that long. So here are the, the students in there. I don't know if you can see, but there's a little student's face, and there's one up there, and this is a student. So even though middle school students can sometimes be apathetic about certain things, they were totally thrilled with this. And I printed out a copy and gave each of the participants a copy of that. So I'm sorry if it's illegal. <laughs> it's derivative work. I don't think it's illegal. <laughs> and how do you don't post it online probably? Don't sell. Well, but, but you can't yeah, sell. You can sell for educational purposes. Education. Right? So. Yes, you can do derivative works of, and, and for satire yeah. at any time. And okay. parody. Okay. Oh, that's right. Satire, yeah. parody. satire and parody, you can do derivative work. So, I'm okay. okay, you guys? You're good. You're good. Right. You're good. <laughs> Collaborate with your other instructors. Add some, maybe some hints of what, some questions or suggestions, any type of suggestion. That's a great idea. I have never really collaborated with teachers in the past. Although when they pass through, sometimes they want to play the games and, and they have fun <laughs> doing it too. But no, but I think that would probably be a great idea. To, to so do you have like a little table or a work? place for with all these like supplies like you did like the little uh valentines and the turkey I, do they have a place where they could go and color and, and then stick it up or give it's it to just you one or? of our library tables that i'll have like the i just got some craft paper to make the valentine so just 
just set that stuff out at a table and they just come and do it on their own it's not like they ask like a class coming in to actually do this exactly i never had a full class participate they've always come in on their own and kind of said like oh what's that stuff and then i tell them and then a couple kids will do it then a couple kids more will come see what they're up to and so yeah i i don't know if it would work in a a large, you know, I'd have to have a lot more supplies, and it might be like too pricey for me. But, but the way it is now, kind of, kind of works for our library. Do you have a teacher uh, club, teachers club? A teachers club. Staff, you know, because I was no. thinking, if you did it with the instructors, you can, because there's usually some money in teachers club for little get-togethers and things like that. Oh yeah. If you ask them. Uh, and you create one for the, the staff, you can probably get the prizes through their, their funds rather than spending your own money. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we could look into something like that if, if we wanted to really get some cool prizes. But so far, it's like, I kind of. Yeah, don't where the get kids, the it doesn't matter. They like anything. Yeah, yeah right. they're, the staff they're happy with is a little with the, with the fortune cookies and fortune cookies and baby pumpkins. pumpkins. <laughs> Yeah. And the monkey stickers, oh my gosh, I've mean, never seen anything as hot as those monkey stickers. They're <laughs> yeah. just this thick, you know? Uh -huh. I had everybody wanted one. <laughs> yeah, that is a phenomenon. And have you thought about, um, like, because you're, you know, hitting important subject areas like vocabulary and a lot of history stuff, have mm -hmm. you thought about working, like, with the social science teachers and having it be kind of like a cross-department thing? I think that would be great, and we kind of started a little bit of that this year just because we had a huge happy birthday constitution sign in the library that the social studies teachers brought their kids to sign. I didn't, I wasn't in charge of it, I just actually provided the space. But when they came in to do that, then the social studies teachers noticed, oh, you, you've got other stuff going on. But I think you're right, I think maybe reaching out to teachers and getting a little more. Yeah, because I know that. Uh, Middle schoolers might not always find like, the Constitution that exciting, but right. um, you know, and that they're expected to like take a big test on it and stuff. Yeah. But as part of like their lessons, they yeah. can like go have these fun things in the library. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. This year you can tie it to the election and you can order oh, online okay. I voted stickers. And you oh, can use oh. that as yeah, you should definitely have an um, election. And I can wear those. And mm, I think that the last election, that was a big hit. Yeah. Everybody wanted an I voted sticker. Teachers gave extra 